Good morning, everyone. If we could draw everyone in here, come on in. Come on in, if you would, please. We have, uh, I knew that there was going to be uh, several people gone today, so I'm not surprised to look out and see that, uh, that our numbers are few. But you know what? I, I completely trust in God's sovereignty. And, uh, and I trust that he's in control. I trust that the ones that he wants here today are the ones that are here. And I trust that if you are here, that makes you one of them, and God's going to work in your heart. That, that's what I'm, I'm hoping. But uh, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I'm glad to uh, be able to uh, worship the Lord along with you guys. Uh, let's begin with a song, Worshiping the Lord, The Power of the Cross. You can remain seated. Father, we are grateful for the cross that the Lord Jesus came and died on. 
Uh, what an amazing thought that we could be grateful for such an ugly thing as that, uh, where someone was, was put to death, but it was our salvation, our Savior, came, paid the penalty for the human race that he helped create. And uh, we're grateful for that, Father. Thank you. Thank you that you've opened our hearts to draw us in, to hear the gospel, and to be able to respond to the gospel. Uh, we're grateful for that, Lord. Lord, we pray today for uh, many of our brothers and sisters who aren't able to be here today. A number of them are, are out of town for one reason or another. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would protect them. And we ask that you direct their hearts to worship you somehow, some way, whether they can be in another church or whether they're uh, just together a, as a couple or as a family. Help them, Lord, to uh, worship you today and uh, bring honor to you. Thank you. Lord, uh, a lot of our neighbors are involved in uh, the canoe marathon uh, right now, and we pray that you'd protect them. We think, first of all, of the racers, and uh, I'm sure many of them feel like they're close to heart attacks right now. We just pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. And then, Father, those who have been following and helping, we pray that you would protect there. We know that uh, car accidents are a possibility. We know that other things can happen, and we just pray, Father, that you to you. Uh, may our words uh, encourage each other, but may they uh, bring glory to you also. Thank you. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a few announcements I would like to go over uh, with you. Uh, just to remind you of a couple things. First of all, at uh, the end of the month, uh, next month, uh, September 28th, uh, it's going to be out at Maslinski's. And what we did I say that? got a few people that are at this point planning on being baptized. Uh, if you have not been baptized yet uh, since you became a believer, uh, come and talk to me and we would love to have you be a part of that uh, with us. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Saturday or Sunday, August 28th out at Miss Lenski's, it'll be following our morning service here. Uh, we have the ladies book study coming up this next Saturday. So ladies, uh, keep that in mind. Put it on your calendar. It's going to be here at church at uh, 10 o'clock Saturday morning. And then I have a letter that I'd like to read. For those of you that aren't aware of it, uh, during our, our last week uh, afternoon service, we had our quarterly business meeting, and the church voted to uh, give a gift to Whitney while Whitney is on her internship. I, most of you know she started her internship. This is the last bit of her education to get her veterinary technician license. And uh, so she will be without income for the next uh, eight weeks or so. And uh, so they decided to do that to help her, and that was an encouragement. Well, here's her letter. She says, uh, Dear HBC family, thank you so much for the gift of money you gave to help me during my internship. It will be a great help during the coming weeks. Your generosity ministered to me, my parents, and anyone else I talked to about it. Thank you again, Whitney. So, but thank you very much uh, for helping her with that. I know that she greatly appreciates that. Um, just remember to uh, pray for each other, uh, especially, like I said, this week, as uh, many people are gone right now. Uh, pray that the Lord would protect them and uh, bring them back safely. I'll remind you that we have our offering baskets by the door. If the Lord lays on your heart to give this week, that's where you'd put it, and then we will uh, take care of it afterwards. Okay, I think that's all of our announcements. If you would, we will sing together again. Uh, this time we're going to sing, You Are My All in All.
we've been working through a list of new songs that we've had recorded, and we're going to sing another one today. Uh, maybe many of you know this. I think the melody is simple enough to where you'll pick up on it uh, pretty quickly, but it's, I worship you, almighty God. Use the one in all capital letters, Donna. I forgot to tell you that. We've actually got a couple songs recorded by a couple different people, and that's the one that we'll use. of those songs that I'll end up humming for the rest of the day. So I enjoy that. And we'll sing it a few more times in the coming weeks. Uh, I have a few missionary letters that I'd like to read to you. Um, as we get these, I, we, I don't always read them in the morning service. Sometimes we'll read them in the afternoon service. But let me read a couple of them uh, to you today. This one comes from the Sturgeons, who are ministering down in Bolivia, in the mountains in Bolivia. <clears throat> and it's dated uh, July 2022. It says, several weeks ago, the sister-in-law of Junior died in a motorcycle accident. We have been asking for several months for prayer for the salvation of Junior and his family. Junior is the owner of a hardware store in the village of Monteguro, close to our home. His wife, Rosemary, is a school teacher in Bella Victoria, another village farther down the road from us. It was Rosemary's sister who died. It has been a difficult time for Rosemary, so Junior asked if I would speak to Rosemary. Rosemary has been more close to the gospel than Junior, so we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity. We invited them over for dinner with the hope of witnessing to her with the support of Junior. We spent several hours with them answering questions, and she and Junior were given a clear gospel message, but there was no decision made. I think that we broke the ice with her, and we pray that her and Junior and their two young daughters will accept Christ. September 22 and 24, or through September 22 to 24, we are planning evangelistic conferences at our church. We've renovated the church, and it's in good shape. The folks are excited about it. It'll be the first such meeting that we've had since Terry and I have been here. And then he signs it, Bob and Terry Sturgeon, and they list a number of prayer requests. I will post this on the bulletin board out there for you to be able to see. Uh, our other missionaries are the uh, Ringelbergs, and as you know, the Ringelbergs are in a building ministry. They work down with Continental Baptist Missions in Rockford, down near Grand Rapids. And uh, he is involved now, especially with getting the blueprints and other things together so that they can help these missionary works. Uh, and the churches that they're dealing with, they're not just helping any churches. They're helping churches that are in missionary status. And that's either because they're a brand new church that's been planted, and a lot of times they buy older facilities that need to be redone so they can use them. Or they're a church that's been around for a while, but for one reason or another has slipped back into missionary status and needs a supported pastor. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is there are a number of things in here that talk about what they're doing, and I'm not going to read it all because a lot of it is just kind of technical. They're talking about the various building projects and what they're actually doing at the churches. I'll hang this up out there so that you can see uh, the pictures of the different works that are going on. But I did want to uh, take note to show you the different churches that Pete and Dar are presently helping with. One of them is Bible Baptist Church of Sparta, Michigan. That's down in their area. Another is Green Corners Baptist Church in Belding, Michigan. And then another is a church that Paul and Kim used to go to down in Gibraltar. It's called, they've got it listed here, Gibraltar Baptist Church uh, in Gibraltar, Michigan. But you said it's Gibraltar Bible Baptist or Baptist Bible, something of that nature? Oh, okay. Well, he just had a, a typo here with that. And, and they list a number of the things that they are doing with that particular church and give the pictures. So I know Paul and Kim will be interested in looking at those and uh, so forth. But Pete uh, does a lot of things with blueprints and so forth, and he makes this comment. He says, the blueprints that I was able to produce because of your support for us for Green Corners Baptist Church has enabled the CBM missionary builders to completely renovate and enlarge their warming pantry and serving area. And he goes on. But I thought it was interesting that they just noted that it's because of our support and churches like us that are involved in supporting them. Uh, they also are helping a church called Good News Baptist Church in Katy, Texas. So they help churches all over the country. Um, right now, a lot of them are close by in Michigan, but an awful lot of them are either in Texas or are in Montana. That's kind of all over the place, and they list a number of those. So I will put this up for you to be able to see exactly what it is that they're involved with. And then I want to read this. This comes from the agency that the Ringelbergs come from uh, down in, um, in uh, near Grand Rapids, uh, for Continental Baptist Mission. It says, Dear Heritage Baptist Church, greetings in our Lord. This is the last letter of thanks for me personally as president of Continental Baptist Missions on behalf of our missionaries. And this is from Bill Jenkins. It says, in June of 2019, we presented and received the approval of the CBM board to move ahead with our three-year transition plan. My tenure as CBM president will end on July 1st, 2022. So uh, this letter came at, it was written for the end of June, so he's actually done now uh, with the mission as far as being the president. It says, throughout the last 16 years of serving as CBM's president, God opened the door for Terry and me to minister in churches across the United States and Canada. We have been blessed to see many come to know the Lord as their savior and hundreds of believers make decisions for a closer walk with the Lord. Terry and I deserve and believe, or Terry and I desire and believe God would have us continue to serve as CBM missionaries in a special ministry of equipping the saints based on Ephesians 4.12, which reads, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then he says, our ministry will be threefold, evangelism toward salvation, education toward sanctification, and encouraging toward uh, steadfastness. And then he says, CBM has served churches and missionaries for the last 80 years, and we look forward to God doing great and mighty things in the years ahead. Thank you for being a part of this ministry through our financial support of our home office and the missionaries serving to establish biblically sound and spiritually healthy churches on the home front. In his amazing grace, Bill Jenkins. So he is now finished as the president, and I'm not sure if they have already have another president in uh, line or not, but we will find out more about that. Uh, thank you for praying for them. I know that uh, they would greatly appreciate that. Let's move forward and sing another song. This one is from your hymnal. It's hymn number 82, if you would turn there, please. Hymn number 82, Blessed Be the Name. Amen. Yeah. 
Father, we truly do bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, not because we have the power to do so per se, but because he's blessed us so much. And we just return the blessing from our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for devising salvation's plan so that those of us who, who realize we are sinners and realize that because of that we deserve spiritual death and that the Lord Jesus has suffered that death for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for making us your children. And I pray that you'd work in our hearts now to draw us closer to you. Help us to walk with you as we ought to. Thank you. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please take your Bibles and turn to the uh, book of Mark. We are actually doing something a little different now. We finished our study in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And I decided instead of starting a, a long book series right now in the middle of the summer, I, I wanted to do a shorter series. And then uh, come September, I'm planning on uh, moving into an, another direction. So uh, we'll see when we get there. But what I wanted to do now is I, is I want to do a short series that I've actually done in the past, but I want us to revisit it in a few instances. It's called Interactions with Jesus. And what I mean by that is, is there are people who have had interactions with the Lord Jesus in the scriptures. And I want to look at those different situations and uh, consider what was going on and consider how it might impact our lives today. But let me ask you this. If you could talk to anyone from the past, who might it be? And there's probably a lot of different uh, names that are coming up. We probably all have relatives that we'd like to see. Maybe it was mom or dad or, or uh, one of our children or something of that nature. Lots of people we could talk to. But if you could talk to historical figures beyond your family, who might it be? Can you imagine if you could get the chance to actually talk to Jesus and to actually uh, uh, interact with him about various things, maybe about things that he went through back then. But what about interacting with him about things that he's allowing us to go through even now? Uh, what might you say? What questions might you ask? Well, we're going to look at one of the stories today. You can see I've got it written through the roof. And if you're a, a good uh, thinker and you're already at Matthew chapter 2, you realize we're talking about the man who was let down through the roof that had to meet Jesus because he needed to be healed. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But I, I want you to think about this while we're going through it. And we'll, we'll revisit this idea at the end of the message. Is There's a little bit of a moral dilemma that comes up when we look at stories like this. Stories of this man being healed and how it served Jesus' purposes and so forth. And the question is this. Did God and Jesus use people to prove their own points? Did they use people, uh, you know, for their purposes and so forth? Uh, and if, if that's the case, should these people feel used? Y you know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes you might wonder when you're going through an issue or so forth, and yeah, you, you want God to use it for his purposes, but have you ever felt used? Have you ever felt like that God's just using you for his own things? And, and, and I guess that kind of implies that maybe he's not considering your feelings on the matter. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? Is it fair or is it unfair? Uh, and, and we could look at calamities, but what about blessings as well? I mean, it'd be one thing when you're going through a calamity and you wonder, why, why are you blessing them and it's going so well for them and not me? But put the shoe on the other foot. Maybe you should be thinking, Lord, why have you blessed me so much and yet you're allowing them to go through some of the deep waters that they're going through? So just, just keep that thought in mind. Think about that, and we'll revisit that uh, question at the end of this time. But right now, let's look in, in Mark chapter 2, and let's read this particular story. It begins at verse 1 of that chapter. And again, he, that is Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. That, that, that should cause you to pause for a minute. What's this got to do with sin? Hmm, think, just wonder about that. 
Verse 6. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoned in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately, He arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And by the way, uh, this is a local town, and uh, probably all these people knew that paralytic and knew what the situation was. So it's not like uh, uh, some uh, uh, scam evangelist that can get people pretending to be sick. Uh, They knew uh, who this person was. But uh, let's pray as we get into this. Father, please open up our hearts so that we could understand this and uh, we could look and see the story and imagine what happened back then and, and how uh, it was used uh, for your purposes. Uh, but also, Lord, help us answer that, that question as well, as well about us uh, being used by you. Uh, help us to see into that. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, begin by uh, looking at the background. Uh, in other words, the context. What's the context? What's going on here? Uh, The time frame of this story is that it is near the end of Jesus' first year of ministry. So remember, he he ministered for about three years or so uh, before he went to the cross. But this is toward the end of his ministry. And as it said in verse 1, he was in Capernaum. And Capernaum was a town that was uh, on the top of the Sea of Galilee. If you, if you could see a picture of, uh, of Israel, there's the Dead Sea down toward the bottom, a long stretch of uh, body of water, and then the Jordan River goes between that, and then up at the top is another body of water. And up there is where Jesus is doing a lot of his ministry. That is uh, the area that's called Galilee. And so that's where he was ministering. Jerusalem is down here closer to the Dead Sea, and he's going to go down there later. But right now he's ministering up there in the top of what we would consider in the day uh, the country of Israel. And he's ministering up there in the town of Capernaum. Now, the town of Capernaum, actually, there's a lot of different things that happened there in Capernaum. If you would see, uh, um, I, I should have put a map up, and I just, I just didn't think about that. But you see the town of Capernaum. Across the water, across the top part of the, of the lake is Bethsaida. You'll probably remember that name. That comes up a few times in the scriptures. And then just over from there is where he fed the 5,000. And then they got in the boat, and they came back across the water. And that's where Jesus walked on the water. That's where the storm uh, was stilled in another instance. Uh, We see a bunch of different stories going on. Anyway, this is the area in which he was ministering. And Capernaum was considered his center of operation, if you will. And uh, that's where he did a lot of things. Now, verse 1, it says that, uh, again, he entered Capernaum, and it says it was heard that he was in the house. This may be where Jesus lived. Now, this particular house uh, wouldn't have belonged to Jesus. He didn't own a house, but some think that it was probably Peter's house, Peter and John's house. Uh, Remember, they were brothers. But it was here, if you were to turn back into chapter 1, that we see the story of Peter's mother-in-law getting healed. So their family was there, and we think that this is the same house where these things were taking place. So if you will, Jesus was at home. This is where he stayed many times. And uh, he had just been on a trip. I, I, I found this interesting. I went back and I was reading some of the backstory here. They had decided after they'd been in Capernaum and he healed Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus said, look, let's go to some of these other towns around and let's minister because that's what I'm here for. And they went and they ministered. And one of the last uh, stories was uh, where he had healed, a, um, he had healed a, a leper. You see this in verses 40 through 45 or 46 of chapter 1. And he healed this leper, and he told them, he said, look, don't tell anybody about me. You you realize Jesus actually did that a lot. There are a lot of times when he would do miracles or other things, and he'd say, don't tell anybody about me. And, I I mean, he knew that they still would. In fact, that's what happened with this leper. This leper went off, and it didn't slow him down at all. He had to tell everybody 
But, but Jesus said that probably because it wasn't time yet for him to reach the zenith of his fame because that's when uh, the religious leaders were going to uh, take him captive and then put him to death and so forth. So it just wasn't time. He was just trying to set the stage, make the right timing. But after that happened, Jesus then he said he couldn't even minister in those cities anymore because too many people were coming. Too many people wanted to be healed and so forth. By the way, Jesus' ministry coming to earth wasn't for the purpose of healing that's what some people think. Some people think that's why he came. He should heal people. And, and in fact, that's why some people think we should still have the gift of healing today so that we can go about healing everybody. That wasn't what Jesus was there for. Jesus was there to present himself as the Messiah and for people to accept or reject him. But the healing was part of the proof process. You know, the proof is in the pudding. If he really is the son of God, these are things you would expect him to do. So he did those things, but he didn't heal everybody. I mean, I've heard people say, boy, probably, I bet if you went back and did a search of all the deaths that happened in Israel, uh, it was probably the lowest number of deaths there ever was in their history. I doubt it. I, I, I would have to think that everything was just normal as it always was. Yes, he did heal a number of people. Yes, he did help with a number of things. He showed great compassion in a lot of ways, but that wasn't what he came for. He came to present himself as the Messiah. And it got so bad after that leper went and started telling everybody that Jesus it says that he, they couldn't even go into the cities anymore. So he had to stay outside and minister out in the wilderness, if you will. And then right after that in chapter 2, verse 1, is when they came back to Capernaum. So you, you kind of see the, the situation that's going on there. Now, what's the immediate uh, issue going on here in this story of the uh, paralytic man being healed? Well, first of all, it, part of it is that Jesus' popularity is building. And, and since he got known so well in the other towns in the region of Galilee, as he came back, uh, his own town, they, they already knew about him, but they keep hearing more and more of the stories going on. So once they found out he was in the house, boy, they just flocked there. And, and they come there to hear more of his teaching. Probably there were people looking to be healed, all of, all of those types of things. But one of the issues that rose during that time was uh, the question of his authority. And, and really what, it, what we mean by authority is, is who is Jesus? And if you can answer the question of who he is, then you see exactly who his authority is. In, in other words, if he truly is the son of God, this guy's got power. This guy's got a authority, if you will, if you want to put it that way. So that issue is at hand, and that's the issue that's going to be dealt with here. And you see that not only did the people come to see Jesus, but a lot of the Pharisees and scribes came. They came to see who he was. Now, the Pharisees, they were a group of people that were um, average citizens, if you will. They, they, weren't, they didn't have royal birth. The, the scribes or the Sadducees, they were, they were part of a, of a family group. And they had power based on uh, what families they were born into, but not the Pharisees. Pharisees were people that just wanted to follow the Lord, and they got involved in teaching the scriptures, and they did a lot in the local towns, the local synagogues, and they would teach the scriptures. And if you will, in the day, they were the conservatives that were around. However, they went too far with their conservativeness, and they started creating all kinds of rules and regulations and laws, and they, they went too far the other way. You know, but they were coming in here. They wanted to see exactly who this Jesus is and what he has to say. So they're in this house, and they have this huge crowd that's going on. So that brings us to point number two. Let's look at the interaction. Let's look at what actually happened here as we consider this story. Now, it says that every, the, the whole house is filled up. In fact, you couldn't even squeeze more people in by the doorways. It was just packed. And so here comes this man, this paralytic. This man who's paralyzed. Is that, is that, is that um, uh, politically correct to call him a paralytic? I don't know. What would we call him uh, today? Uh, walking challenged or something like that? I, I don't know uh, how it would be. But he's laying on a bed, and he wants to uh, be brought in to Jesus. Obviously, he wants to be healed. Or it's even possible, I've heard it suggested, that maybe he was in such a state, it wasn't so much what he wanted, but his friends wanted him to. And uh, I, I kind of believe it probably was all of them, not only the four guys that were carrying him, but him as well. And they thought, if we could just get him to Jesus, then uh, maybe this could be taken care of. Now, have you ever wondered how he became a paralyzed person? 
Uh, it's possible he was born that way. Uh, Jesus runs into a number of people throughout his ministry that were born paralyzed or born blind or something of that nature. It's possible that happened, but just the way that the story goes and as they read between the lines, I don't think so. I don't think he was born that way. I think they probably would have mentioned that. But I think uh, somehow he became paralyzed. Was it some kind of an accident that he became paralyzed in? Uh, we, we don't really know. Let me ask you this. Was his, paraly was his paralyzing accident, if that's what it was, was it sin-related? Hmm. Keep that in mind. That, that idea is going to come up uh, later. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just think about that in just a little bit. Well, anyway, these four guys carried him, and they took him up on the roof. And they decided, we're going to let him down. If the people won't get out of our way and let us in there, uh, we're going to let him down through the roof. So they decided to cut a hole in the roof. Now, you might be imagining houses like what we have here. Uh, most of our houses have a, a, a peaked roof of some sort, steep. That's not how the houses were made in Israel during that day. They had flat roofs, actually. Flat roof with a little bit of a wall around the outside. And when you come to the evening and the sun is going down, the house is still really hot inside. So they would go up on the roof. And that's where they would sit and enjoy the cool of the evening. Um, a lot of times they would even sleep up there in, in months like this because it was cooler than it was in the house. And, and so the, you probably had this flat roof. And the houses were generally made out of clay. And, and what they would do is they would wet the clay down. Maybe they'd mix some grasses in with it. And, and when they were making the roof, they would actually create these, as, as I understand it, these stronger panels. They were like clay panels. They'd put them down on top of the rafters. And then they'd get this mud mixture that would become clay. And they would put it over the top of it. And they'd spread it out all over it. And it would seal off the roof and hold those panels together. And that way, when the rain and so forth came, it wouldn't go through the roof. It would drain off through a hole on the side uh, somewhere like that. So these guys, they decided they got up on the roof and they started tearing it apart. And they started pulling the things apart. They probably came down to where these panels were. And, and I'm sure these guys knew how the houses were made back then. And they pulled the particular panels off that they needed until they made a hole big enough to drop the fellow down in. I don't know how well you can see that picture. I love that picture, but you can see the, the four guys or a couple guys up in the top still holding ropes. They're the ones that let him down in. But you can see the hole in the room. Can you imagine the mess that that would have created? Can you imagine if you were inside there with Jesus and Jesus is talking, and of course you could probably hear the commotion going on, uh, but then you start getting bits of debris falling, bits of dirt, uh, bits of, of grass maybe that's mixed in with the clay. It probably was just kind of a weird situation. And I can imagine everybody just kind of step back, you know, I don't want something to fall on me. And they watch this hole open up, and then they see this guy let down. So they put him down in here. And he comes uh, in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus do? It says that Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. I don't know about you, but you, you, something like that should make you stop and think. It does me. I read that and I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why did he go there? I mean, you could use the Sunday school answer and say, oh, I know Jesus is God and God loves us and God forgives our sins. And that's too easy of an answer, though, even though that's all true. But, but why? I mean, why would that be immediately what he went to? Well, we know the rest of the story. Jesus was going to use this uh, to, to prove a point here. But I, I, I'm wondering that, uh, that there was something involved in this guy's life, maybe. Somehow, some way, I wonder if his particular paralysis had to do with some sort of a sinful activity. I mean, maybe the guy had been a thief. And maybe he had tried, maybe with his four friends, they had tried to break into someone else's house the same way, break open the roof, and he fell through and got paralyzed. Well, then you're caught, right? Now you're caught, and everybody knows what you're doing. Everybody knows your situation. You know, it's about like you, uh, uh, you've heard stories of people who have a dog, and they come home, and the dog's got a, a prowler caught up on the, the fridge in their garage, and the prowler's afraid to get down because the dog's down there growling at him. Well, the guy's caught. Well, what if the guy did get down? Well, then he's going to get caught also, right? Not just by the dog, but who do you arrest? Well, the guy that's got all the bite marks on it, right? The guy whose arms are torn up, the guy whose face is kind of tattered. Yeah, he's the one. Well, it makes me wonder about this guy. Is, was, his, was his paralysis because of something like that? Maybe he was involved in thievery. Maybe he was one of the guys who was a rebel. In those days in, uh, in Israel, there were lots of people that wanted to rebel against the Romans. 
And maybe he was involved in it somehow, and he got hurt in battle of some nature. I, I know that I'm reading between the lines. I know that the Bible doesn't say this, but, but it just causes you to think that way. Now, he would have been looked at maybe as kind of a hero type of a person if he had done something like that, but still, he's paralyzed. And in those days, people looked at it as, if you have some severe problem like that, it must be that God is punishing you for being a sinner. That's just how they looked at it. And uh, you'll remember the story of the man born blind when they asked Jesus, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. And he goes on to explain why uh, this was going on in the man's life. Well, in this situation, it's not that Jesus is condoning it and saying that it was sin, but don't you just wonder? You wonder if maybe he got paralyzed somehow, somewhere. Maybe he was just doing something foolish. And everybody in town knew about it. And so when Jesus said to them, uh, said to him, son, your sins be forgiven. I have to believe a lot of people standing around went, whoa, and, the, and it, it, the, it connected. But the people that it didn't connect with were the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the scribes there, the religious leaders. What did they immediately say? They said, this is blasphemy. Why is this man committing blasphemy? They said, only God can forgive sins. Now, it's easy for us to get down on some of these religious leaders and think that everything they say is wrong. But do you understand that what they're saying is absolutely right? They are right. Only God can forgive sin. And that's why they noticed that, that to them it appeared to be blasphemy because they assumed that Jesus was just a man. And they're saying, only God can do this. This is blasphemy. So in the sense they're right, only God can do it. But where they're wrong is not recognizing who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus does have the power to forgive sin. So therefore, on the one hand they were right, on the other hand they, and they were wrong, and uh, so now they've got this guy who's sitting here dealing with this, and, and you have to just wonder, wow, look what's going on. This is quite a crazy thing. But his friends, they, all they knew is Jesus appeared to be able to heal other people. Let's get him to Jesus, and Jesus will heal him. They probably didn't expect for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven, but it happened. So everybody's kind of, their minds are spinning right now. And they're going, wow. Well, the religious leaders are thinking what they're thinking. And it says that Jesus uh, saw within his spirit. Interesting, Paul. I, I didn't even think about that until I was reading it. Paul's, Paul's teaching about the Holy Spirit. And, and he talked about this idea this morning of Jesus' spirit. But Jesus perceived within his spirit. Well, the only reason he could do that is because he is the Son of God. And so he did have an amount of omniscience. Now, as a human being, it was veiled. He didn't use it all as far as that goes because he was uh, limited to his human body, at least in some degree of some way. But God allowed him some practice of his divine uh, attributes. And he, he reasoned within his spirit. He could, he could tell uh, what these guys were saying. And so he said to them, uh, why do you reason that way? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your bed and walk? Uh, that's an interesting thing. It's, it's hard to prove that your sins are actually forgiven, isn't it? I mean, you can't, you can't uh, maybe pull up a piece of paper and say your sins are forgiven. You could do that if you pay off your mortgage, right? The bank sends you a, a document that says your mortgage is paid off, and you can show that document, but you can't do that with, with your sins. And so that would be kind of hard to prove. So right now the religious leaders kind of feel like they've got an upper hand. But for Jesus to actually say, what if I say you're healed? Now that would be something, right? That would be something for these people from this small town in Galilee who knew this man and knew that he was paralyzed and to see that Jesus actually made him to get up and walk. That would be really hard to do. But boy, would that be a great proof, wouldn't it? that would certainly give evidence of who Jesus was and evidence that he could, in fact, forgive sin. Uh, not that they have to believe the evidence, but the evidence is there. It's, we can see it, and we certainly understand it. So Jesus told him, arise and walk. And what did he do? He rose up, he took up his bed, and he walked out. And it says here in Mark that all the people there were, were glorifying God. They were, they were praising God because they knew something was going on. Even if they didn't understand completely who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Messiah, they, they had to have been thinking somehow, some way that, that God's blessing what he's doing. 
I mean, maybe he's just a prophet and God's working through this prophet. That might be their reasoning on all that. But, but, but they, they gave glory to God, it says here in Mark. If you went over and looked at the same story in Luke, which we won't do right now, but over in Luke chapter 5, it says not only did the people praise God, but it says there that he departed glorifying God. This guy was praising God. This guy knew what was going on. This guy knew that God had done something big in his life. And this guy, if, if his injury was because of his, uh, some type of sinful activity, and, and Jesus not only healed him to walk, he released him from the burden of that sinfulness. And he walked out of there praising God, thankful what had happened. And so it's, it's really an, an amazing uh, situation here. As, uh, as the story goes on. And it's just another story in a long line of stories of things that Jesus did to show who he was and show what he could do. Let's, let's go back now and think about that moral dilemma I brought up in the beginning. Uh, that idea of, is God using this man? Could this man have looked at God and said, you're just using me? Uh, did Jesus just use him? Well, the short answer is yes, Jesus did use him. Jesus did use him uh, for his purposes. Jesus did use him uh, to show who he was, to demonstrate that he was deity, to demonstrate that he did have real power, to add um, um, power to the argument that Jesus was the Messiah. So yeah, in a very real way, Jesus did use him. So the question is, is, should the man feel used? And by that I mean in an unfair way. Should the man think that he was unfairly used of God? Well, first of all, if he was hurt because of some sinful activity, I'd have a hard time with a guy really thinking that, uh, that this is unfair of God. If anything, he should say, this is really merciful of God. Because I'm a sinner, God could have just walked away from me and said, never mind. But, but no, he used me, but... We don't know if it was a sinful activity or not, so hard to say. But, but should he feel somehow that it's unfair or, or something like that? Should he feel used? Well, I think you could look at the answer two ways. I, I, I think there's a yes answer and there's a no answer. On the one hand, uh, he could feel, yeah, that, that, he, that he was used of God because he was used of him. I mean, we know that. We know that Jesus used him to demonstrate his deity. Uh, but he was healed. He was healed in this particular case. So I would have to think he wouldn't dwell on it very long. In fact, apparently with him walking out praising God, he didn't dwell on the idea that, that God was just using me. No, he was pretty happy. Uh, no matter what God's reasons were, this worked out pretty good for me, he must have been thinking as he walked out praising God. But as far as feeling could it be fair or unfair, it really is a matter of perspective. And, and I think this is why we need to consider this. It's a matter of perspective. What is your perspective of your existence on this planet? Now, we each are individualistic in, in many different ways. I mean, when, when we think of, of existence, we think of our existence. We think of, we think of me. You think of you. I think of me. You, you get what I'm saying? We each think of ourselves in, in this uh, situation. And, and everything kind of revolves around wh what's going on in our life, right? And so we look at it that way. So if this guy's life revolves around himself and that that is the most important thing that's going to happen in the history of the world is what happens to me, well, then he might look at it as unfair if he thinks that that is the most uh, important thing. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, in the last week, and, and e even before I started studying for this, a couple things popped up that I saw online, uh, where, where people are saying things about, about God and how God uh, uh, works in their lives. And there are some people that take everything and they make it about me. Uh, I remember seeing one thing, and they were trying to encourage. It, it was something that was trying to encourage people to keep on following God, keep on going, but the way they encouraged God, or the way they encouraged these people to follow God, was that it was all about you. You need to know that God is here to make everything good for you. Uh, uh, one, one of the ones said that, look, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy, 
and God needs you to be happy. I think is what one of them said that I actually read. And, and, and as it went on, it said, look, God is saying to you, I've got this. God is saying, I, I'm working on your problems. One of them actually said that. I'm working on your problems right now, so I've got this. It's good. I need you to be happy. I need you to be joyful. Now, let, let me just say, that is, that is not biblically sound advice. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to be happy. God does a lot of things, and he does bring joy in our lives. God, God creates a lot of joy. He creates a lot of happiness. But God's goal in all of our existence is not to make you happy. Uh, eventually, you're going to be very happy. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to spend eternity in heaven, you're going to be living where it is absolutely wonderful, and you're going to be extremely happy. But during this time frame right now, while you are alive on this earth, God's goal is not just to make you happy. God's goal is not to just work in your life so that everything goes good for you. And we should know that, shouldn't we? Because all of us have gone through difficulty. All of us have gone through heartache. All of us have lost people in our lives that, that may have made us ask, why, God, why would you do this? And I don't know that it's even a bad thing to ask why necessarily. I think David in the Psalms asked why a number of times. But if you'll notice, at the end of those Psalms, David always comes back around to submitting to God's sovereignty. He may ask, why are you doing this, God? But in the end, he'll come back and say, but God, I know that you're wiser than I am. God, I know that you have a plan. I know that you are working out. So he never stays in that state. And frankly, the reason there are so many Christians that are depressed in their Christianity and that are, that are disillusioned with God is because they've got it backwards. They think it's all about me. And when it doesn't work out the way I think it should work out, how dare you, God? God, I'm mad at you. I've heard people say that even just recently. I'm mad at you, God. Well, they've got it all wrong. Who are we to talk that way to God, to think that way about God? The problem is, is we've got it wrong. Remember I mentioned before it's like that genie in the lamp? We treat God that way. We think that we rub the lamp, and then God will do what we want. He'll give us three wishes or whatever. Uh, it's, it's probably listed as some other way. You know, you live this way for God, he'll do this for you. Uh, you do these other things. Uh, you pray this prayer, and God will do this for you. Boy, some religions do that a lot, don't they? Here, pray this prayer. Pray it five times this week, and this is what God will do for you. It's all backwards, and it's certainly not supported by the Scriptures. Uh, that, that's an issue. So it's a matter of perspective. If life revolves around you, you just might feel used by God. However, if you see life as the fact that you are part of God's creation, God created you, yes, he's got a good plan for you, yes, he's got a future for you, but yes, he has the right to use you for his purposes right now. He has the right to do that. In uh, Romans 9, I'm not going to turn there right now, but in Romans chapter 9, uh, Paul is talking about that very thing, that God has plans and he's working these things out. And he says sometimes people could stop and say, well, well why is God doing this? Uh, should, should we even care about how we live because of this? God's working it all out the way he wants, right? And, and he says, you need to be careful. He said, God's the creator. We're the creatures. God's the potter. We're the clay. He says, the clay doesn't look to the potter and say, why did you make me this way? You know, the potter could make you a beautiful vase, or he could make you a little bedside garbage can to throw the trash in at night. Well, I don't want to be a trash can, God. I want to be the beautiful vase. As a clay, you don't have the right to say to the potter, how dare you? You just don't. Instead, you say, I'm going to serve you, God. If you've got me as a, as a bedside garbage can, I'm going to be the best bedside garbage can I can be. And I'm going to hold that trash for you so that your house stays clean and then you can throw it out later. You, you see the point? We need to have that mentality that we're willing to serve God no matter where he's placed us, no matter what he's put us in, because God is sovereign. I want to turn for a minute to Colossians chapter 1. I want to read uh, beginning in verse 15. It says this, talking about Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven 
and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Did you get that? All things that were created were created by him. All things were created through him and for him. Why did God create us in the first place? For him. For him, not for us. Not because God was bored and thought, boy, I want some people that I can spend my time making them happy. You know? I mean, again, God does make us happy. He does bring great joy into our lives. And eventually it will be all glory when we're in glory. But right now, these things were made for him. It says, and he is above all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and that is all the fullness of deity, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He's the creator. He's made it all. It's all for him. And yet he was willing to come and die on the cross for us? Wow. We've got no room for complaint. I mean, we can complain, and God allows us to complain from time to time, uh, but we need to repent of that too at some point and, and see that God has a plan. Rather than feeling like I'm being used, rather than feeling like how dare him uh, do that kind of stuff uh, for me. No, we exist for God. And we need to have that mentality. Now, unbelievers will never accept this. Unbelievers will look at this, and to them, that just makes no sense. Because it's all about me. It's all, it's all about everything being made right for me. And, and, and they see that. But we as believers, we have a different mindset. Remember the scriptures say that when you turn to Christ, you've been made a new creature. Your, your mind has been changed, and it has been changed. We have a new perspective on life. And we should be willing to serve him. I'm going to turn uh, to another spot in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, you remember in 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul says something like this. He says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That, that's our purpose in life. If you looked at the flow chart that we have for our church on how our ministry works, it all starts with the top box that says to bring glory to God. And everything else flows from that. That really should be our mindset as well. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to start reading uh, in verse 7. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watch and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's a matter of perspective. We forget why we're here. It's about God's glory. It's about God's uh, righteousness prevailing. And uh, that's why we can put up with the thought that God is going to punish sinners. And that God does have a literal hell that people are going to spend eternity there when they reject God. Uh, you can see that because what's it all about? It's all about us glorifying God. That's what it's there for. And then Peter even goes on. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. But when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy because we're going to be glorified with him. He goes on to say, God uses us for his purposes. He, yes, he blesses us abundantly. Uh, but on this earth, on this 80, 90, 100 years that we're going to live on this earth, uh, we are still in our sinful body. We are still living in an environment that's under the curse of sin. Things are going to happen. God never promised that only, only unbelievers will suffer bad things and believers are going to have it all good. He didn't say it. No, because, because we are part of the human race and we are part of sinners, we are living under the curse of sin. So we are going to have difficulties along the way. 
And yes, God can use that to point others to himself. God can use your difficulties to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That should excite us. Not that we're ever excited about going through difficulties. And who knows, the Lord could cause something to come up this week that would be horrendous in my life that I, that I wouldn't like and I, I wouldn't want to go through. But yet, I need to have that mindset that I'm here for God's purposes and I am going to get the payoff eventually when I'm in heaven, when I'm in glory. It's going to be wonderful. I've shared the story before. You know the story about the man and lady that are watching their health. They died in a car accident. They went to heaven. They showed him around heaven, and it was wonderful. And then the man got upset at the wife, and she said, what's wrong? And he said, we could have been here 10 years ago if it wasn't for your muffins, your brand muffins, you know? Yeah, the day's going to come. We're going to be in heaven, and it's going to be wonderful. And, and God's going to bless us for eternity. But until all that happens, we need to understand that life right now is not all about me. I mean, it is, I'm a part of it, and God does care about me and care about my existence, and the same for you, but it's all about God carrying out his plan, leading us to the point to where we will get to that glory. We will be there, and, and I am looking forward to that. I hope you are too. Let's pray. Father, give us a mindset to be your servants no matter what happens. Father, help us to not be caught unawares when we find ourselves in such terrible difficulties and, and, and help our, our faith to fall away. Rather, help us to be strong. Help us to follow you. Help us to understand that in a sin-cursed world, difficulties are going to come. But Father, give us the mindset that we can point others to Jesus by the way we go through these things. Help us to do that, Lord. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Let's sing one more song together. Take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 321, It Is Well With My Soul. This is a song that was written by someone who was going through terrible tragedy, uh, lost a number of his daughters in a, in a boating accident, and yet still decided, Lord, it's well with my soul because you've got all this under control. Let's sing the first and the last dance. <clears throat>